Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, give us a call, 208-991-4783, and to become one of our friends over on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, well, this episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thank you so much for all your support. Uh, today's episode uh, actually is from February of 1948. It is called The Case of the Avenging Blade. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley. Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Tonight there's frost on the windows of Dr. Watson's familiar study, and an overcast sky threatens another fall of snow. But as we sit snug and warm in front of a glowing fire, our thoughts turn to Sherlock Holmes and his immortal exploits. Well, which one are we to have tonight, Dr. Watson? Tonight, Mr. Harris, I think I'll tell you the case of the avenging blade. One of the most touch-and-go, not to say hair-raising adventures, it was ever my privilege to share with the sage of Baker Street. Meaning Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I was certainly not referring to Mrs. Hudson. (laughs) Yes, when I think how close that sword came to decapitating the person we (laughs) both... There I go, anticipating again. But before I become further involved in the attempt at murder which occurred at the base of the equestrian statue of Charles I... Suppose you stop me long enough to say a few well-chosen words on another important subject. Hmm? I'll do my very best, Dr. Watson. You may have noticed that Clippercraft clothes are never on sale at reduced prices. There's a reason for this. It's that Clippercraft clothes are so low-priced in the first place, for such remarkable quality, that sales just aren't necessary. What makes these amazing values possible? Right in your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Well, it's the famous Clippercraft plan. The plan that concentrates the buying power of 1,036 great stores across the country, creating year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. You're the gainer through the efficient Clippercraft plan. That's why you pay only $40 and $45 for a Clippercraft suit, only $40 for a top coat or overcoat, and only $26.50 for sport jackets. That's why your eyes will pop with amazement when you see the fine tailoring and the rich, long-wearing fabrics at these low prices. Yes, compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to the Avenging Blade, the attempted murder and the equestrian statue, Dr. Watson. Yes, yes, the famous statue of Charles I stands in Charing Cross, which, as you know, is often called the center of London. Charing Cross, isn't that the open space to the south of Trafalgar Square, Dr. Watson? Correct, Mr. Harris. But uh, to begin at the beginning, it is one of those clear, rare days in late January which now and then surprise the city of London. The sky was a brilliant blue and the light, powdery fall of snow reflected the dazzling sunlight outside. Holmes was lounging on the sofa in a brilliant purple dressing gown, his pipe rack within his reach, ashes scattered on the floor... And a couple of morning papers littering the room in all directions. My dear Holmes, no one could accuse you of being a tidy man. Only in my head, Watson. My brain houses what is probably the most accurate and complete collection of information in all of England if not in the entire world. And it's all in meticulous and precise order. Conceit. Not at all, Watson, merely accuracy. But of what use are my unequal mental abilities? 
For months, there's been no crime worthy of my attention. No case with any originality, any imagination. Oh, I wouldn't say that. You found the Shah of Baghdad's missing emerald. You outwitted the band of nihilists who were threatening to blow up both houses of parliament. Hmm. Commonplace. Strictly routine investigations. Oh, oh there's a front doorbell. Maybe it's a case. Well, look out of the window, Watson, and see who's on the doorstep. That's a good chap. Ooh, pity you wouldn't bestir yourself now and then. Mm, Polish man. Dressed in Highland regalia. Bonnet, kilts. And even wearing a Scottish dirk in his stocking. Hmm. Rather drafty attire for a day like this. By the way, Watson, what day is it? Wednesday, of course. I mean, what day of the month? Let me see. The uh, 30th, I believe. Well, at least according to the Times it is. Yes, I think we may grant that that is one subject on which the Times is fairly accurate. The 30th of January, of course, it's the anniversary of the beheading of Charles I. So that's why he's donned his kilts. Mrs. Hudson is slow answering the door this morning. He's looking up here. Great Scott Holmes, it's the Duke of Buckinghurst. I suspected as much. Well, for heaven's sake, don't just sit there, Holmes. Help me to tidy him and, and tidy up this clutter. Well, well, what sort of an impression do you expect to make sprawl there in the midst of all this mess? My dear Watson, if his lordship has a case sufficiently important to warrant my attention, he'll be in no mood to notice trifles. If not, I'm not interested in his lordship. I'm not impressed by titles, Watson. They're so apt to due to the chance of heredity, like red hair or a Roman nose. At least you might straighten your collar. Oh, come in. Oh, Lord Buckinghurst, this is an honor. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. No, 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 not that chair. I, I think you'll find this one more comfortable. May I uh, relieve you of your bonnet? Uh, would you like a drop of brandy? Watson, if you'll stop playing the palpitating hostess, Lord Buckinghurst might like to explain why he's called to consult me. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. It's all so fantastic, I... I really don't know where to begin. If I had received this note at any other time, I'd have put it down to some poor demented half-wit. Persons in my position, Mr. Holmes, are unfortunately the recipients of a great many curious communications. Everything from begging letters to blackmail. There's nothing fantastic about blackmail in your position, Lord Buckinghurst. Consequently, that is not the gist of the letter that brought you here. Good Lord, no. But it's so well, it's incredible. I, I hardly know how to describe it. Suppose you allow me to view the letter and judge for myself. That, that would be the most sensible procedure, I suppose. Here you are, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. Paper, excellent quality. An educated script. Half English, half continental. Notice the final S's, Watson. Huh? Well, yes, but uh, to blaze it with the S's, what does it say? You must pardon my friend's lack of restraint, Lord Buckinghurst. He will never realize that the writing paper and general appearance of a letter often give me more information about the sender than the contents of the message. I think you will agree that the contents of this letter is of no small interest, Mr. Holmes. Mm, yes. Let's see. To the late Duke of Buckinghurst. Hmm, interesting. Beware the blade of the martyr king. Brief but uh, bewildering, eh, Holmes? Not entirely. Lord Buckinghurst, you are, if I am not mistaken, descended from the Duke of Buckinghurst, who was the favorite and boon companion of the ill-fated Charles I. Correct, Mr. Holmes. As the eldest of my family, it thus evolves upon me to attend the memorial services which are held every 30th of January by the Royal Martyr Society and place a commemorative wreath on the pedestal of the statue. Designed, if I am not mistaken, by Grinling Gibbons. Really? I had no idea. It's not so old as the statue, I believe. The, the, the pedestal, I mean. Quite. Tell me, Lord Buckinghurst, does this expression, the blade of the martyr king, have any particular significance to you? Why, yes and no. I presume it refers to the ancient superstition which concerns the sword in the statue's hand. Which is? It seems that after the monarchy was restored, Charles II witnessed the execution of Thomas Harrison and the other regicides at Charing Cross. After the bloody event was over and his predecessor had been avenged, he made a proclamation to his followers. <laughs>
You have witnessed the fate which befalls those who dare to turn against the crown. And so that you shall be reminded thereof, I hereby decree that on this spot shall be erected the statue of my martyred ancestor, Charles, and to his hand shall be restored the sword which he carried at Marsden Moor and Naseby, and which was taken from him by the Scottish friends who foully betrayed him to his enemies. If any man dare henceforth to plot against the crown, let him beware that sword. They say, Mr. Holmes, that when a traitor to the crown approaches the statue, the sword trembles and cries out for vengeance. How is that supposed to affect you, Lord Buckinghurst? Blessed if I know. And yet, uh, someone obviously wants you to believe that if you attend this ceremony today, there'll be a catastrophe of some sort. I see, why not just say in words you have a bad cold and can't attend? As a medical man, I'd be more than glad to vouch for your indisposition. Never. Whoever wrote that note doesn't know me very well. If he thinks he can scare me off by any such hocus-pocus... Or he may know you very well. Tell me, Lord Buckinghurst, if you should be incapacitated on any of these occasions, who would be called on to place the wreath on the pedestal? Why, uh, my heir, of course. You uh, have a son old enough to represent you? No, Doctor Watson. I allude to my brother, James. I'm a bachelor and have no children. If anything should happen to me, my brother inherits the title. By any chance, Lord Buckinghurst, was your brother educated in France? Why, uh, yes, Mr. Holmes. He attended the Sorbonne. It was while he was studying in Paris that he met Claire, uh, uh, his wife. Oh, I see what you're driving at. You think James may have written that note hoping to keep me at home so he would have the limelight in today's celebration? No, no. In the first place, my brother knows me too well for that. And in the second place, he's insufferably shy. He'd die of stage fright if he had to make a public appearance of any sort. But he will attend the ceremony. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. The entire family will be there. Hmm. Should be a rather colorful affair. What do you say we accompany Lord Buckinghurst, Watson? Oh, with pleasure. And I promise you, sir, that whatever the danger is that threatens you, you'll be quite safe with Sherlock Holmes along. Don't be fatuous, Watson. <laughs> Why do you think I dropped in this morning? But uh, we'd be better be getting along. The program begins in half an hour. Oh, there's no hurry. We have plenty of time for a stirrup cup. Uh, scotch, I believe, would be appropriate to the occasion. I take my advice and drink it neat. Those breezes round Charing Cross are very brash this time of year. Uh, shall I get the bottle, Holmes? No, Watson. I'll do the honours. Uh, you might fetch my greatcoat, however. And your service revolver. That's a good chap. Right, Holmes. I don't know whether you know it, Lord Buckinghurst, but the statue of Charles I you are about to decorate has a rather ironic history. Really? It was cast in 1633 by Hubert Le Sir, a pupil of Giovanni Bologna, that had not yet been erected when the Civil War broke out and the first Charles was deposed and beheaded. It was subsequently sold by Parliament to a brazier by the name of Rivet. Rivet? <laughs> Appropriate cognomen, eh, Holmes? Don't interrupt, Watson. Mr. Rivet was ordered to melt the statue down. Rank vandalism. That's the trouble with people always wanting to destroy someone else's handiwork. Calm yourself, Watson. Remember, the statue does stand in Charing Cross today. You mean old man Rivet uh, didn't destroy the silly thing? He announced that he'd done just that. And for years, he made a tidy living out of selling fragments of metal as souvenirs to both cavaliers and roundheads. However, when the restoration came along, he sold the statue back to the government at a neat profit. It was subsequently erected on the spot where it now stands. Well, the old scoundrel. I say, uh, Lord Buckinghurst, you uh, look a bit glassy-eyed. Uh, don't you feel very fit? As a matter of fact, I, I do feel a bit squeamish. Must be the most of the handsome cab. Never had it affect me this way before. Hold tight, we're nearly there. Just turning into Trafalgar Square. Goodness for that. 
Yes, look, Holmes. There's the statue up ahead. Quite a group of people gathered around. Lots of them wearing kilts and uh, there are bagpipers. <laughs> I do enjoy a Highland air on the doodle sack, you know. Oh, here we are, Lord Buckinghurst. Good. Get me out of here. Uh, you all right when I get my feet on terra firma. Robert, we thought you would never get here. They've been waiting nearly half an hour to begin the ceremony. The pipers have blown themselves practically out of breath, keeping the crowd entertained. Sorry. Claire, my dear, may I present Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Gentlemen, this is my brother James and his wife. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Quite. Oh, how delightfully exciting. But, Robert, why a detective at a time like this? Just a precaution. Precaution? Precaution against what? Do not tell me there is something of which my brother-in-law, the indomitable Duke of Buckinghurst, is afraid. As you do look a bit wonky, Robert. Is there anything wrong? Matter of fact, I, I do feel a trifle under the weather. Oh. There, that Finn and Hattie I had for breakfast must have upset me. James, if I should have to retire suddenly... You take over when it comes time to place the wreath. Oh, but I, 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 I couldn't. I, I couldn't really. Why not? Uh, everyone would be looking at me. I, I wouldn't know what to do. You don't do anything but carry the wreath, escorted on either side by bagpipers playing a dirge. But uh, when you reach the statue, you place the wreath at its feet, and the pipers break into a Scottish battle song. That's all there is to it. Am I right, Lord Buckinghurst? That's all. Uh, James, no, I... no, no, I can't let him do it. James is just out of his sick bed. He would have to remove his overcoat. And in those kilts in this icy wind, it would probably kill him. The wind, they declare? I say, look, the ceremony is nearly ready to begin. The minister's about to read the benediction. Uh, you'll, you'll have to excuse oh, me. Oh, Robert, you, you can't leave now. I have to, James. I, I, I think I'm going to be sick. I know I'm going to be sick. Holmes, what did you put in that scotch you gave to Lord Buckinghurst? come the bagpipers with the wreath. Well, Lord Buckinghurst hasn't come back. Looks as though you'd have to carry on, Sir James. Oh, dear, dear, I... I, I do wish Robert would come back. I, I'm not at all good at this sort of thing. James, not... I forbid you to do it. You can't take off your overcoat. Let someone else place the wreath. Let Mr. Holmes do it. Uh, thank you, madam, but it's an honor to which I'm afraid I cannot aspire. My ancestors were mostly roundheads, you know. I'm afraid King Charles wouldn't approve. I wouldn't want to come within striking distance of that famous sword. Oh, you are joking. Such an amusing man. Am I? Oh, dear. Yes, they, they've noticed Robert is missing. They're bringing the wreath to me. Here, somebody hold my coat. Oh, no, James, no. Sorry, madam. You know the expression, noblesse oblige. Carry on, Sir James. Yes, I... I, I suppose I shall have to. Oh, dear, I... I wish I'd stayed in bed. James, you fool, you idiot. Not a very impressive figure, the cadet branch of the House of Buckinghurst, eh, Holmes? No man with knocked knees should wear kilts in public. Still, there are all kinds of courage, Watson.
James, if he's reached the statue, he's, he's kneeling to place the wreath. Watson, quick, hand me your revolver. Yes, but what will... I don't like the angle of a statue sword over his head. Oh, Holmes, have you taken leave of your senses? You know when they start to play the battle cry. Yes, the pipers are filling their lungs. Here they go. You've broken it to bits. I prevented it from impaling Sir James's body. No, no, this is too much. It's killed him. He's lying on the ground. He's dead. Calm yourself, madam. Your husband's only fainted. The what? sword missed him completely. Oh. Watson, you go and revive Sir James. I'll attend to her ladyship here. Oh, very well, Holmes. Now, madam. Now what, Mr. Holmes? Why did you attempt to kill your husband's brother? You knew the vibrations of the wild Stuart battle cry on the bagpipes would dislodge the loosened sword in the statue's hand. You knew it would probably pierce the back of anyone kneeling below. You screamed to warn your husband before the sword fell. <laughs> mon cher monsieur Holmes. You are almost as clever as people say you are. I will not bother to deny your accusations. Why should I? There is nothing you can prove. What have I to be afraid of? The man you hired to loosen the sword in the statue's hand. With my sources of information, it shouldn't take me more than 24 hours to find him. With my powers of persuasion, it shouldn't take me more than 24 minutes to make him talk. What is that expression they teach the children in this country, Mr. Holmes? Do not count the chickens until they are hatched? <laughs> It's no trick to make ordinary clothes at low prices, but it takes real manufacturing genius to produce really fine clothes that not only look far above, but are far above the modest price you pay for them. That's why we say try on a clipper craft tomorrow. It'll be hard to believe you're getting so very much for so very little. Such expert tailoring, smart styling, and superb long-wearing fabrics. This tremendous feat is accomplished through the renowned clipper craft plan which concentrates the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. It brings you Clippercraft suits at only $40 and $45, top coats and overcoats at only $40, and sport jackets at only $26.50. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B &B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. We find them standing in the dim light of a street lamp which marks the entrance to a crooked lane in Soho. Large flakes of falling snow intensify the expectant silence of the winter night. How much longer do we have to wait out here in this confounded snow, Holmes? It's after midnight. We shall wait here, Watson, until the Lady Claire arrives to pay a visit to the artisan who loosened the sword for her. You see, I was better than my promise. I tracked him down in less than 24 hours. What makes you so sure she'll come? She must, Watson. As long as Andre Bogard is alive, he's a threat to her safety. You think she'll try to finish him off? My dear Watson, a woman who's capable of attempting to murder her husband's brother so that he may inherit. 
He's capable of anything. Holmes, uh, when did you first suspect the Dixon? From the beginning. The letter of warning had to be written either by James or his wife. They were the only two who'd benefit by the death of Lord Buckinghurst. They were the only two who knew him well enough to know the effect the letter would be bound to have on him. You mean he'd attend the ceremony come hell or high water? Exactly. James didn't duck when the bagpipes burst into that violent squalling. Claire, however, screamed to warn him. Hence, she was the guilty party. QED. Here comes a four-wheeler. Yes, it's turning down this alleyway. Down behind these barrels, Watson. It stopped in front of Bogard's shop. I see she's... She's not getting out. No. She's seen Andre's shadow on the blind. Yes, she's lowering the cab window. A woman's hand comes out of the window. It's holding a revolver. Very well, Lestrade, you have your proof. You may come down from the driver's seat and arrest the lady. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, better you use handcuffs on her, Lestrade. By the way, madam, this should teach you. Never, when on a secret mission, never take the first cab that presents itself. You never know who the coachman is. Oh, and uh, thank you so much for your display of marksmanship. I think it'll persuade Andre to tell us all we wish to know. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I never miss. It is too late for Andre to tell anyone anything. I'm so sorry to disillusion you, but it was, wasn't Andre's head your bullet hit. What? Merely a cleverly arranged silhouette of the man. I cut it out of cardboard myself only an hour ago. Oh. You see, Lady Claire, I have artistic blood in my veins. Or didn't you know? You... I think you are the devil himself. No, madam, only his second cousin. <laughs> All right, Lestrade, you may take her away. Well, that was a touch-and-go adventure, Dr. Watson, just as you promised. But tell me, what did Holmes put in the Duke of Buckinghurst's scotch? Something out of my medical kit, I'm afraid. Something called Epicac. It's a well-known emetic. You see, Holmes had to be sure the Duke of Buckinghurst would not be able to perform his part of the ceremony. Oh, I see. And now, Dr. Watson, what's the theme of next week's story? Next week, I'm going to take you back to Hurlstone, Mr. Harris. Hurlstone? Wasn't that the ancient manor house that was the scene of the Musgrave ritual? Right. Next week's story is a different one, however. It concerns a gruesome family ghost story told by Reginald Musgrave's newly acquired wife and how Mr. Plunkett, the Pickle King, insisted on sleeping in the room where Charles I had slept and how the ghost story was reenacted with more accuracy than anyone had believed possible. The makers of Clippercraft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the sanguinary specter. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. 
This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations, the mutual broadcasting system. Be sure to hear Melvin Elliott reporting the latest headline news, which follows in just a moment. Fly Eastern Airlines' new type constellation with 300 million passenger miles of dependability. Fly Eastern Airlines. Remember, there's no finer way to travel. Welcome back. Well, I love the Scottish flavor in this uh, particular episode. And the writers of Sherlock Holmes continue to find historical observances around which to build uh, storylines. Uh, some uh, comments we received on Podcast Alley. Uh, uh, LaDonna says, I think a few weeks, months ago, you were asking about favorite home stories. Mine is Charles Augustus Milverton. I've never heard of it on any radio version, but my mom and I used to listen to the books on tape version uh, repeatedly in the 1980s. Uh, well, uh, LaDonna, uh, it is actually part of the... Uh, uh, Ralph Richardson and John Gilgood, uh, Sherlock Holmes series, so hopefully we will uh, get to that. Stephen comments regarding episode 574. I thought I'd heard all of the Holmes, but had not heard this one. Really enjoyed it. Glad you're enjoying it. Uh, finally, a couple comments on Podcast Alley. Adam, such a wonderful podcast. I love listening to the old-time radio shows, and your commentary just adds to it. Thank you. And then Adam provides exceptional background information and a cheery attitude with every show. Well, worth listening to every day, even if you miss the Petri Wine uh, commercials. Well, thanks so much, uh, uh, Chris, for the comment on Podcast Alley. And uh, we'll actually uh, hear Petri Wine commercials on this podcast uh, eventually. Though not nearly as many as we did uh, during the last season of the Rathbone Bruce, Bruce series. All right, well, that will do it for today. We will be back tomorrow with yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and then join us next Thursday for uh, Sherlock Holmes. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.